that the Anishinaabe community has, if we're going to do restoration of, you know, it's almost beyond, you could say of the earth, because if you mean by the earth, the physical part of the earth, the, the rock, our, our asanik, those rock relatives that John was talking about, the soil and those living microbes and things in the soil, do you mean those plants above ground and below ground? Do you mean those pollinators that come in? Do you mean the spirit that lives in each of those plants and that lives in some places and that lives in those ecosystems? What do you mean when you talk about you know, restoration ecology? Because one of the reasons that one side or the other side struggles, sometimes when I say this one side and the other side, there's a lot of restoration efforts that um, are done by agencies. And so if any of you are familiar with what I do, I've been doing a lot of wild rice um, restoration in, in the Great Lakes, especially in this eastern and southern Great Lakes. And it's been hard work. But at the same time you do ecological restoration, you need to do cultural and spiritual restoration because I hope you took the message that without understanding a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the spirit world, you will be missing a significant part about the physical world. And if you don't like the more cosmological view of things, even some of our most brilliant scientists, like Dawkins, you know, even maybe maybe our maybe our evolutionary man back in uh, the 1800s. You know, I teach my biology students about Charles Darwin and about evolution. I said, you know, the science community hasn't had a debate in this thing. Charles Darwin started as a anybody guess what his training was when he went to college? Yeah. He came out of a medical family in England, a well-off medical family, and he decided, hell no, I'm not following in my parents, my dad's footsteps. I don't want to be a stuffy doctor. So he studied theology at Cambridge back in the 18 teens and 20s. He became a naturalist. Well, somebody gave him a free ride. Hey, you want to become a naturalist on our on our expedition on a schooner that's going to go around the world for a few years? He said, hell yeah. I can get out from underneath my parents and see the world. But he came in with a bias, like we all do. We all come in with a bias. This bias was, I know the Bible, and I know, you know, Christianity from the perspective of England. The power of common thinking then, that he should not talk about this idea of evolution. Until some young chap, my age, co-discovered the same idea. When Wallace <laughs> first started doing his stuff over in Asia, and came to the same conclusions, <clears throat> he was a young guy. And then they both had the opportunity in this little science lesson, um, to present at the Linnaean Society. Carlos Linnaeus was a botanist who was responsible for for, for those names. Any of you had to learn Latin names of plants or animals? All of you know one, Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens sapiens would be a technical name. Um, maybe, maybe you would say, oh, you know, we, we could call this a lot of things. We could call it Mushkadewush. We could call it prairie sage, we could call it Artemisia, Artemisia ledovisiana, we could call it Niji, we could call it Mishkeke. Um but that Artemisia ledovisiana, that Latin name, is a product of that dude named Linnaeus, and this Linnaean society is really big over in England because he figured out how to scientifically name things. But the interesting point was that these two guys who came up with these novel ideas, groundbreaking <coughs> ideas, like some of the things that we're going to hear here today and that you've just heard, came out, but it wasn't until the older chap in Darwin, who had held on to his idea for 20 some years, was pressured by a young man who came up with the same idea and was going to present it. And Darwin was the senior person. He had written all this stuff about his travels. Does that recognize that you are sitting somewhere on this medicine wheel or in this web of life and that those other things out there, do they have some connection to you? Does what happens to them matter to you? It's up for a lot of people don't believe that or don't care about it. Even as a botanist, when I go out and I want to use these things, it's not a conflict of my upbringing from my parents in Catholicism, or from my academic training 
in botany and in a lot of other subjects, including ecology. It's not a conflict with my cultural anthropology training that I had while I was at school. And I definitely is not in conflict with the Anishinaabe worldview that I was brought up with a little bit as a kid, but more as an adult. And some of the sort of you that are here, you know, even though you know I walk in both those worlds, you know, can can vouch for the fact that yeah, I'm somewhat familiar with. I can stumble my way through our Anishinaabe culture and our spirituality. I don't consider myself always in balance, you know, sometimes I'm off to the north or to the west or the east or the south of that medicine wheel road. But the point is, what I try to remind myself and what I try to use to keep on that road is I try to connect with those plants. And when I try to connect with those plants, if I want to collect a plant, what did you hear earlier? We heard that you need to honor the spirit of those plants. What are you going to choose to honor them? You can use your words. You can use songs. Or you can use that, um, that gift that sits in the eastern part of the medicine wheel. Um, we might have heard it earlier, that ninsema. Um, ninsema. This is that Nicotiana rustica, or that ninsema that, that I grow. helps it to keep it from getting root bound so that it will spread out. Do you smell that medicine? Yeah. You guys smell that? That's good.